Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Jamie Hampton, and I get to be here today with Patricia Raybon. Patricia is an award-winning author and journalist whose personal essays on faith, family, and race have been published in the New York Times Magazine, Newsweek, USA Today, and many others. She retired as an associate professor of journalism at the University of Colorado Boulder in 2006, And today we have the great honor and privilege of being able to talk with her specifically about prayer and about her powerful book, which is a personal memoir called I Told the Mountain to Move. So Patricia, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you today, Jamie. I'm I'm kind of compelled and fascinated that I'm here in Colorado and you are in Alaska and um, by the grace of God and the um, technology called Zoom, here we are together. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm excited and um, honored by our conversation. Me too. I'm, I can't imagine, especially during this time, walking through quarantines and all the things that are changing right now um, without technology. It's been, a, it's been a very big blessing in many ways. So, Indeed. Yeah. Well, we like to start off our interviews by asking a just for fun question. So Patricia, what is your favorite prayer closet? Well, I love that question. And um, it sent me back, Jamie, to Matthew 6, 6. You know, that place where the Lord says, when you pray, go into your closet. And um, I'm sure that um, we are, we have the permission to see that instruction as metaphorical it can can be metaphorical because for me and probably for many of you listening the closet is not a small room with a door in my case you know it's the side of my bed in my bedroom or um, kitchen table um, where my husband and I pray often we start the day praying in our in our bedroom with a devotional, and uh, sometimes I'll kneel, sometimes I'll sit in a chair, <laughs> um, sometimes I'll pray here at my desk. This room used to be one, a, a, a bedroom for one of, of my daughters who's now grown and moved away. The, um, the question, thinking about it today, invites me, that's what I'm looking for, invites me to um, think about establishing a particular place to pray. But one of the things I do enjoy about praying is that we can pray anywhere. And so um, so I don't have a closet per se, but I'm glad you asked me because it gives me um, opportunity to think about it. Maybe I'll establish that. Well, and I know we've had people over the time that we've been doing interviews say things like in the shower, because that's the only place I can get away from my kids or (laughs) in the car sitting in the parking lot when I, or sitting in the driveway when I get home, you know, because it's, you're alone and enclosed. And I do love, we can pray anywhere, but I'm like you, I, I definitely, I am challenged to kind of create a space and um, Alana, the founder of Praying Christian Women Ministries, who's also the co-host of the podcast, um, she talks about just like we had kind of a fun conversation about what your ideal prayer closet would be like, where it would be, what would it be like, how would you decorate it, what would be the, you know, would there be a window? And so, I don't know, we're always kind of thinking about setting up places to make prayer inviting, to make it a place where you can feel quiet and at home and Sometimes you've got to make do, but sometimes you can actually create one, so. I'm sure you've heard about John Wesley, I believe, uh, Jamie, was it John Wesley's Yes, yes. Would put a a, a cloth and apron over her head (laughs) in their very busy household. And uh, I can still relate to that, to um, just find a way to close off everyone else to hear the quiet voice of God. Yeah. And I know that the prayer closet 
scripture reference kind of, I think is like, don't, don't pray out, you know, where everyone can see you, you're going to pray just you and God. But I love the fact that for her, her children saw her praying. They knew that she was prioritizing God. And I think there's an element of goodness in that. I don't always do that. Sometimes I go, you know, into my garage or whatever, do the, the shower thing. But there is a time where, especially those with little kids, to let them see you, see you, see praying you praying and set that boundary. You know what? I'm talking to God now. Don't interrupt. And they'll never forget that. Mm-hmm. What a witness and what an example. What a model. Yeah. Children, right? Well, I want to jump right in. I have so many questions for you after reading your book. I was I was sucked in from the beginning and I just I loved this book. Um You've written many, many others, and this is not your most recent, but when I saw it, I just, um, I knew I had to read it. And um, in the beginning, you sort of set the stage for where you were and what launched you into this prayer journey. Not that you weren't a Christian before, not that you never prayed before, but you say in the first chapter, my prayers lacked power. When I prayed, I sometimes got a little portion of peace, but it was fleeting. When I prayed, my daughter's lives sometimes changed, but not by much. When I prayed, my husband's love sometimes warmed, but it didn't burn. And then you said, I was a beggar at prayer. And that, I mean, that, that sums up what mm-hmm. I would consider my own sort of lukewarm prayer walk when, when I'm just kind of going along. And, and so can you share, where did this realization lead you and what steps did you take when you found yourself there? Because I know I've found them, myself there many times and it doesn't end. I mean, I feel like I kind of come back to it at times. <laughs> yeah. So what did you do? I finally learned what prayer is. And I was thinking about our conversation today and I asked the, the Lord to um, empower me to say this well, because that's so important. I thought prayer was about getting things when prayer is about getting changed. And that insight, which isn't original to me, I've now heard many prayer scholars talk about it, but that insight changed everything. The begging had to do with me, you know, asking God for this thing and that thing and the other thing, but never ever understanding that what he was inviting us to uh, approach in prayer is his um, grace to change us. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so in look, thinking about your question today, um, I was reminded that the three most compelling things that Jesus says about prayer have nothing to do with getting things. One is to pray for your enemies. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing is to seek first the kingdom, right? And, and then the third thing is to have faith and, um, and when, and before you pray to forgive. And so, you know, I was, I've been thinking about that and I'll tell you why this will sound silly, but, um, I'm working on a mystery romance novel called The Praying Detective. That does not sound silly. I'm excited. I'm already excited to read it. But yeah, that does not sound silly at all. That's exciting. And so, well, thank you. And um, I appreciate that. But in thinking about it all, um, I'm reminded, I was refreshed and reminded again how this prayer journey is a... um, um, as uh, Eugene Peterson said, a long walk, <laughs> you know, in the same direction toward mm-hmm. allowing the Lord to change us. And if we get to the place where we can pray for an enemy, um, that scripture but is uh, Matthew 5. Uh, and the Lord says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain. So um, a um, challenge that we cannot do except without God is a key piece of the prayer uh, instruction that we get from him. 
while we're over here saying, gimme, 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 um, the Lord is saying, can you take a minute first and um, surrender yourselves to try to pray for someone you don't think you love? Well, that'll take most of us the rest of our lives. And so, and so, um, which we, and we can't do it without him. So, you know, he invites us into this adventure with him that really does cease the begging because we are journeying with him. And um, I didn't understand that at all. And I, I um, love, love thinking about it and um, learning about it and writing about it. And so I'm glad you asked that question today. But then also in Matthew, he says, um, you know, don't worry about what you eat and what you're gonna wear and yada, yada, all the stuff you worry about. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God. Mm. And, um, you know, and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added. And it's another um, kind invitation from God to stop the begging. And mm. instead, be over here living and being in a way that will grow his kingdom. And, um, you know, these are the, the, isn't it amazing that the uh, exciting things about Jesus is how he, ex he stretches and expands our mind and our thinking on things. Because we can be so small minded. <laughs> and so petty and um and he knows that about us and graciously he says um he teaches us no um release that petty stuff and uh, let's go higher and uh, and see what happens there and and then i think what we experience is uh, that we're not begging as much as we used to because we are um, on this journey with him. It's a, it's a, it's pretty profound. I and, love that, yeah. Yeah. And you know, we have family needs and um, you know, we love our, our children and our family members and, um, and we want things, <laughs> if we're honest. <laughs> and, um, and he knows that, but he says, no, have, have, uh, have faith. And so I want you to remind me to go back to that concept because that's a really rich one. And I want to, us to talk together about where Jesus talks about that, which is actually when uh, he curses a fig tree. And I want to help you or ask you to help me um, Ravel that whole story, but it's a, there's a rich prayer lesson in that with regard to approaching prayer, not about asking for things, but by um, moving in faith. And so I'm happy to talk to you about that first. But if you want to move on, we can we can come back to that. No, I would love for you to stop there and and talk about that. That's important. Okay. Um, well. I had to um, give a, I was invited to give a, a prayer, teach a prayer series at a church called Prayer That Moves Mountains. Mm -hmm. And um, and so one of the lessons of the five was on um, having faith. And so that sent me to that scripture where uh, Jesus and his disciples see this fig tree and, you know, he curses it. Well, I had read something by Dallas Willard where he said, faith is the missing link between dead prayer and living prayer. And, um, and that was compelling because Jesus, Jesus did say in that story about faith. But then when I began to dig a little deeper, Jamie, something led me to look up information about fig trees. 
And somehow in my mind, I don't know why, I don't know if it was because of something I'd seen or maybe in a Sunday school class when I was a child, I don't remember. But I had in my mind a fig tree as a very small tree. They are huge. They grow up to 20 feet. And uh, I mean, they're, if you um, have a minute after the podcast, and maybe others will too, um, Google a picture of a fig tree. They're really profoundly big trees and take up a lot of space. They have two big um, harvest a year. And, um, and the leaves are big. I mean, you remember in the Genesis, it says that Adam and Eve covered their nakedness with fig leaves. Mm-hmm. We're talking big tree, right? <laughs> and so um, they come along and see this tree, and, and, but it doesn't have any fruit on it. And Jesus curses it. Of course, it's, you know, it's about, it really speaks to all of us about, we may be bi- in our bigness, you know, we may think we're all, all that. But if we are not um, producing any fruit, we are just taking up space. And so, you know, it's a profound moment in, in um, you know, the journey that Jesus has with his disciples as he's teaching them. And then he says to them, um, you know, that they, uh, the, the antidote to that um, is to have faith in God. But then looking at that passage in Mark, it's about, uh, some, what some of the scholars say, it's not about having faith in God. The, the scripture means have the faith of God, which wow. is big faith, because God can do anything. Nothing is too hard for God. And so that's why it only takes faith as the size of a mustard seed. We just have, we can just even have raggedy faith. But if we have that little piece of faith of God, mm. mountains move. And um, so, you know, I was thinking for that particular class I, I taught, we talked about what kind of faith you have. Well, we have faith. As we're taping this today, it's on a Thursday. We have faith that tomorrow will be Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, we have faith that if I, if I walk across a dark room, and turn on the switch, the light will come on. That didn't take much faith to do that. But what it was connected to was my action. And so when we have even our raggedy faith and tie it to um, the action that will bring about the outcome, then we see uh, the mountain mover moving our mountains. With, with our little piece of um, mustard seed size faith, um, if we'll get up and do something and host a podcast and spend time with Jamie or trust that we'll have a good conversation, if we do a little thing, God will turn that into more than we can, a, the, a harvest we cannot measure. You and I have no idea of the harvest of this conversation. But you and I have this little bitty faith that said, yeah, we'll meet today and let God um, make it bigger than we'll ever know. It's so that's, you know, that's that lesson from the Lord. Um, Of course, there are many that he made about prayer, the Luke 11 uh, lesson about being persistent and, you know, all of that. But in any of that, do you hear the Lord saying, pray for things? No. No. And I think, you know, what you're talking about, I love that with the fig tree is Mm -hmm. I think we sometimes get the idea of having faith in God confused with having faith in an outcome yes saying if i if i pray for this thing that i want if i conjure up enough of this feeling (laughs) 
in yeah. myself. I do this work and yes. If I just, you know, if I pray with enough, you know, gusto and if if I get enough people around me and you know, not that there is not time for praying with gusto and, and gathering people around and just powerfully pounding at the door of God. Yes. But we confuse that and I think that's that picture of that huge tree with no fruit is we we confuse having faith in that outcome with having faith in God himself. And there there is no fruit on the tree when your faith is only in the outcome that you want. Yes. And it brings me to this question that I just, I, I love the way that you put this about praying God's prayers back to him, which kind yes. of to me encapsulates that being rooted in that faith. When we share the mind of God, when we, you know, and you even quoted Richard Foster in real prayer, we think God's thoughts. I mean, that's powerful. Yes. But what does that look like? And how do you come to that place? That I think that's the key because in my life, I think, and I always say this, and I think sometimes it's a cop out, but sometimes I feel like I, I trust God and I believe God and his power to do things. I don't always trust my ability to hear him right. So yeah. what is that? Like, what is praying God's prayers back to him look like for you? And that, and how do you go about discovering that and discerning that? In the word. And, um, you know, last night, for example, we have a, um, a Wednesday night Bible study at my church. And so, you know, we're in a pandemic. Um, it's very, it's very easy to decide to do something else besides make a note in my calendar, take the time to call in to the Bible study, <laughs> hear God's word taught. And then um, from that, the, last night, for example, the lesson was on Proverbs 3. We were looking at life principles. You know, uh, trust in God with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And so when we, we pray, we can pray that back. Lord, I'm struggling to trust. I, I lean on everything else but you. And so that kind of prayer is really centered, right, in what mm -hmm. has already been taught us. And, um, you know, God is gracious like that. This morning I was thinking, I'm not a prayer scholar. I'm not a theologian by training. I'm not a, um, a seminarian. Um, I'm not, oh, I can list a long list of, of what I'm not. I'm pretty sure I'm not qualified even to be on the podcast talking about prayer. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, if I take a minute and open the word, I'll find a um, clear indicator of one way, just one way in that one moment of what to pray back mm -hmm. to the Lord. We don't, I think we, don't you think we, we complicate it? And um, and we don't have to. He's, the Lord has done the heavy lifting. He hung on the cross. Yeah. I mean, I think of cease striving and know that I am God. We, we flail and we flounder and we try our hardest to fight. And I think you're right. I think a lot of it, you, you also talk about just resting. I don't, I don't yeah. have the exact words, but how you would, when you were first discovering this kind of new idea of prayer, of just like resting resting with God and just being still. Is that what you did? Just kind of sit in silence? What did that look like? Um, the, um, Psalm 91, one, has that beautiful instruction that says, those that dwell in the shelter of the Most High will rest Patricia and Jenny, <laughs> in the shadow of the Almighty. And um, I, uh, there's, there was a woman at our church who lived to 107 by, in, in vibrant health until up to the 
pretty much the last day. Mm. And I asked her about that one time. And she looked at me as if if the answer were obvious. She said, I paced myself. You don't get to 107 rushing and striving and, you know, climbing and all of you know the pace of God is restful and that goes against everything that our society is set up for yes I mean our culture and we, we you and I are Americans and our culture is particularly um, we are fixers yeah and we're socialized that way and um, and that one thing it means is even in our faith lives, we just won't stop. You know, we're go, mm-hmm. go, go. And um, and then the um, the invitation from the Lord is to um, be one of those who dwell. And I love that word. Mm-hmm. To just take a minute, girl and sit yourself down and and stop moving for a minute and you know when we do that we can hear his still small voice and uh, we cheat ourselves when when we don't take that kind of time you know just you know even if just to sit for, sounds funny, but if, if one of us, if we timed ourselves and to sit for just 60 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, when we realize, wow, if this 60 seconds feels that good, you know, what if I took five minutes with God? Mm-hmm. You know, what if I took, you know, us 15 minutes with the Lord and just stopped talking? my talking and let my spirit hear his one of your questions was um ask me about writing down our prayers yes and one of the things that um i made a note to myself not only does it provide a record we can go back to and see um the things that the lord has accomplished but one of the things i like about it is that i have to sit down and to, in order to write something, then I have to think a minute. Mm-hmm. And that time is just so healing and uh, gracious. And um, just talking about it, you know, when I mentioned that prayer class that I, I was offered, asked to teach, at one point I said, what if we just for right now all just take a deep breath and, um, and then let it out. And everybody said, obviously, that felt so good. I just did it over here. <laughs> and I thought, when's the last time I did that? When's the last time that I just sat and breathed in and breathed out? It's powerful. It is. It's very powerful. This morning, um, we, I was out in the front yard. <laughs> and um, we, we used to have... A, a sprinkler system but that's another story so what we have is a hose a hose and one of those whirly things mm-hmm. so I, I put that on and then I just sat on the porch <laughs> you know and watched the water and this um if we cheat ourselves from these moments especially if we um don't allow the uh, lord to be there with us that's a lot of that's that's big cheat and uh, so there's rest in that and then and also then the lord graciously speaks to his spirit speaks to ours you know that you've heard that um not august not augustine yeah was it augustine who said no no martin luther i have so many things to do that um, i have to wait three hours (laughs) and i think i'm sure that's been paraphrased and not exactly what he said but the idea is um i have so much to do that first i need to just be still with the lord for a while that that prayer 
yeah, yeah. But the, the amount of prayer is is directly proportional to the busyness which is the opposite of kind of what we would tend to do yes yeah and then what's amazing to me is that when we get up from that prayer half the stuff that was on the list the lord has already taken care of we have talked about that on the podcast before it's amazing it is truly amazing <laughs> yeah it's a phenomenon and i know whether it's god giving us the perception or perspective to do it more efficiently or some of the things just disappear. I mean, it's crazy. I think we create a lot of busyness for ourselves that God never had on his list. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. very freeing. And yet I find myself going back to the old ways and, you know, just having to really fight to get myself to a place where I'm taking yes. that time, but it's so important. And one more, so important. And one more piece of that is leaving the prayer with him mm -hmm. and, um, and going on with our day. And I love the illustration in the Bible where the friends bring the sick man and um, to Jesus. And there's so many people in the house and, and, and I, everything. They break through the roof. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. And lay, and what do they do? They lay their friend at Jesus' feet. If we look at that story again, the the friends are not shown as ever saying anything. They lay the problem at the feet of Jesus. They just put it there kind of by faith, like, here you go. <laughs> wow. And so in the mornings, um, as we do that, knowing we can do nothing without him, there's nothing too hard for him. So, um, and if in our prayers at night too, there's no need for us to be up at night all night <laughs> or in a, in a spin all day if we've laid the mountain at his feet. Yeah, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking about the difference between, you know, the Bible talks about keep petitioning, but I kind of think that's, you know, as we feel that burden mm -hmm. on us, that's when we have to keep laying it at his feet. But I think we confuse that sometimes with needing to beat down the door through yeah. our own strength. Again, that same thing about like, we're just tempted to think that conjuring up something in us is going to make it, I, I don't want to say make a difference, but yeah, get, get the job done. When I think it's more of a surrendering that need to God, just, uh, that just kind of seems like part of what you're saying there. And I think that yeah. is important. A, it's, it's, it is a key difference. You know, James talks about praying fervently. Mm -hmm. and I think we hear that meaning what you're talking about that just impassioned on on and on and on and on mm -hmm. um pounding at the door of heaven and um probably there's no more um powerful picture for the lord than uh, surrendering it to him and um you know, Lord, I can do this problem. I can do nothing with this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know you can. I know you already have the answer. I can't see it, but I know you, and I know you already have the answer. And um, so thank you for the privilege, prayer, the privilege of prayer. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the privilege of laying this and leaving it with you. Well, I think about in your book, you share quite a bit about your daughter, Alana, and her leaving the faith and your journey through that and what your prayer life looked like through that time. And there was a time where, um, well, one of my questions I had before was talking about how one of the things you prayed how to reach her. And the answer was kind of surprising. But in general, you came to a point at the end where you felt like God was telling you, I've got this. Now, does that, how has that changed your prayers for your daughter and your even relationship with her through that realization? And are there still times where you do some pounding or where you feel like there's something that needs specific prayer that you keep praying for? Yes. Um, yes and yes. 
the first thing it did was um, untie our relationship so that instead of being at each other's throats all the time and in that power struggle which mothers and daughters have a lot of times right anyway anytime, yeah um it allowed us just to be uh, friends and to um you know i i um had forgotten all the things that i loved about my daughter and um you know, she, the one, one thing she was asking for beyond the faith, the, our interfaith um, life, was respect. And so I looked at that word again, Jamie, um, in, in the Latin, it fundamentally means to look again. Hmm. And so when I looked again at Alana, I saw, oh my gosh, um, you know, she's um, hardworking, a loving mother, a, a, a beautiful wife, a good friend, a good citizen. You know, she completed her formal education. She goes to job every day and, you know, had this long list. And, you know, the Lord was saying, you all be, look at all these ways you can engage mm. with your daughter. Leave the faith issue with me and um, love her in all, in all these other ways that she is. And that's um, been a lesson that we all can apply in all of our relationships. I needed to apply it in my relationship with my husband and with neighbors and with friends. The, I know that my Christian friends want me to say that I prayed and I prayed and I prayed all night long and then she came back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. What the Lord has said is love her and trust me. And trust that I, there are a lot of other things that I'm doing that need to happen before I answer this big prayer that you want, this prayer that you want answered. And so that, you know, it's, it's a total trust um, process to keep loving, to keep trusting, and to keep praying. And so, yes, she knows that I want her to know, um, love and know and return to the body and the bosom of Jesus that hasn't happened yet and so um, in the meantime my job is to my job is to keep praying loving and praying and that's a pretty good job uh, description you know my grandchildren um, love me, love me, love me. I'm just a very ordinary grandmother, you know. We all, and but they think, oh, Grammy, Grammy, Grammy. Um, <laughs> my daughter loves me and says that she does. My son-in-law loves me, um, and Jesus loves me. And how he answers that prayer, I don't know how he will answer it, but I don't have to know. That's, um, we want to know, we want to be, yeah. we want to be the people with our hand on the lever. Yeah. We want to give them details of, oh, you know, God, it would be so easy in this situation to use this, to make her see this. And, you know, we want to manipulate yeah. things, but I thought it was really neat though, when you talked about how, when you, you went, the importance of the Holy Spirit being our teacher and mm -hmm. that the key to being able to, to pray with power is to invite the Holy Spirit into our prayer lives. Can you tell the story about what happened when you were praying for God and just for the Holy Spirit to help you understand how to reach your daughter and that unexpected answer that you got? Do you know what I'm you know talking what? about? To the thing that he asked you to buy her. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, well, before I talk about that, 
Yeah. Um, I was thinking this morning how if we, you know, our, the Holy Spirit is graciously our advocate, our helper, our reminder, our equipper. Um, I was thinking, you know, if we're not, um, if, if we're not inviting the Holy Spirit into our prayer life, prayer life we're operating at about 10%, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, or something like that. And, um, and so in seeking the Holy Spirit's guidance in, okay, how do I love my daughter? The uh, one instruction I got was to buy her a scarf. She covers, and um, and sometimes the coverings look plain to me. Mm-hmm. And so the Lord, the Holy Spirit, invited me to buy her a pretty scarf. She was so moved by that gift, Jamie. Mm-hmm. So touched by, it. and I bought her over the years several pretty scarves for you know different occasions, different things. Um, the, the, um, I'm not by nature a loving person. I mean, I, I didn't grow up with, I grew up with very, very good parents, but part of their generation is they, that they weren't, um, hands-on loving. And so I've struggled with knowing how to show love. And even to tell somebody that I love them. And so I've relied on the Holy Spirit's help to show me when and how to do that. And um, and it's blessed me, and I hope it's blessed the people in my circle. And, and I'm not sure, I hope, I hope I'm saying this right for people who, struggle in that same way but it, but again if I don't stop during the day and take time and be with the Lord I'll miss opportunities to love other people because in that time I'll get reminded the Holy Spirit will remind reminds us remember to call so-and-so remember somebody needs a simple sympathy card whatever it is um, I forget if I don't take the time to be with our heavenly father. Yeah. Well, and the gift that you gave your daughter was not something you would have conjured up. And in fact, I, you probably in your mind thought, well, this is a symbol of her having left the faith. Her other faith. Yeah. And so, you know, well, God, God might not be pleased with that. You know, that's, that's what would probably be going through my mind. And so when the Holy spirit gives you that, that, that idea that would never have come from yourself, that has to be powerful. And so, you know, just, just to remember for all of us to, to pray outside the box, open our minds to a God who is bigger than our own preconceived notions of him, if that makes sense. Um, Not that we're going to go against scripture in any way. God will never tell you something that's against scripture, but something like this, I think is definitely a divine appointment and yeah we get twisted around doctrine and is this doctrinal and all of that um paul um said and now i will show you the most excellent way Mm -hmm. and then there's that great chapter about love if you Mm -hmm. speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love you're just a clanging symbol and a sounding brass and a clanging symbol right. and um you know that now that's a good chapter to review routinely and jesus said you know what's the teach what's the most important of the commandments love the lord with all your heart mind soul and strength and love your neighbor love the other folks as yourself mm-hmm. it's hard to do love and um and it's um, it, I think doing love is the best way not to have to worry about is this doctrinal. <laughs> yeah. If it's a good love, we're in, we're, in, we are aligned. Yeah, I definitely yeah. agree with that. And I think humility comes with that too. And 
you talk in the book about moving from piety to arrogance when prayers are answered sometimes. I thought that was very telling and, you know, exposed me in some of the times where I can think, oh yeah, one of the pitfalls to seeing a prayer answered is that well, sometimes... Let's see. <laughs> Well, I must be this somebody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be known as, as the, the prayer guru or something. And so, I mean, that is so honest and so real. What does that look like in general? And how do we recognize that in our own lives? And how do we keep ourselves in check when, when we do recognize it creeping in? Well, there's, you know, several uh, rich uh, scriptures that tell us don't be conceited. Yeah. Don't get don't get it twisted. You're not that much. You're not that mm -hmm. big of a deal. Right. Um, but also, I think one of those scriptures that reminds us to um, uh, acknowledge God, God, to thank God. Yeah, I remember and him. So in that thanking God, the um, I was telling a friend just the other day. She was talking about how during this pandemic. Um, sometimes she has trouble sleeping and so I, I ask her if she'd ever be willing to try um, you know a gratitude journal but um, I was telling her the, what, the, what mine looks like just um, you know a here's one right here um, you know a little notebook right and then I, at the top of a page I write the date this is my end of end of the day um, practice, Jamie. Write the date at the top. Write, draw a vertical line down the middle. The left side says, give to God. The right side says, thank you, God. And then just while I'm sitting there on the side of the bed, um, I will write down those things that I'm grateful for that for that happened during the day. Um, I'm so glad I connected with Jamie, you know, those, you know, those things on the list. And I think those things, um, I think the practice um, helps us not fall into that arrogance trap because it's showing us like, um, look at what the Lord has done mm -hmm. today. Um, awful lot and a lot of times the thank you God list will be longer than the gift to God list sometimes the gift to God list is is long but I love the days when wow I'm running out of paper um, there's just so many things that I'm so grateful for that he did and so you know I think it then, then arrogance begins to dry up when we are more involved in, in acknowledging him. Yeah, I, I think just the more we see who God is, the smaller we feel yeah. in a good way. <laughs> That's great. Just, yes. Well, we are, we're kind of coming to the end of our time, I think. I think I just love, I want to end with this question. Um, I thought it was really, as I came, I don't know what year you wrote this. What year did you write this book? Um, it was, I believe, in 2000. I'll hold it up. I happen to have it on my desk. It was in um, 2005. Six, I believe. Okay. See, I have my copy too right here. <laughs> and I loved, I loved writing it, and I'm, I love that I still hear from people about it. Yes. That's, that's humbling. Well, I thought it was very interesting, having written it that long ago, that there was a quote in there at the end, and it was, it was the worst year ever, then it was the best year ever. So what if nothing in that, so what if nothing in that year made sense? And that reminds me of 2020 so far. And it, it just, as I read that, I just felt hope rising up. Like, you know what? That could be this year. Because a lot of things aren't making sense right now in so many ways. And in so many ways, I see people talking about, you know, we're going to just skip 2020. But that's not what God wants. What, 
what has your, where does your own prayer life look like through the ups and downs of 2020 so far? And what encouragement do you have for us in looking back when we get to December, looking back that we might be able to look back and say, maybe it was the worst year ever, but it was also the best year ever. Well, I have found myself praying a lot for our nation. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been one of those people in that room doing that kind of praying. Yeah. And um, praying for the, um, the health of our democracy. I mean, I'm such a, as, as a woman and a wife and a mother and a you know, grandmother, a lot of my prayers probably like um, many of the women who are, who are listening have to do with the family. So it's a bit of a surprise for me, Jamie, to find myself praying for our nation mm -hmm. and feeling that that's an appropriate thing um, to do right now. We've prayed a lot for uh, people who are infected with the COVID-19 um, illness. And so, again, usually I'm praying for health of family members. Mm -hmm. And now, um, you know, I'm, my husband will say in, in any particular morning, Lord, um, for those who are, are struggling with their health, and they're struggling to breathe today, mm -hmm. um, who are afraid, who are in hospitals, or we pray for them. We pray for the uh, doctors and nurses and healthcare workers and and so I, to answer your question, I think this year has um, reminded us that the, um, the prayer energy can be, or our arms, of, we, let's let our arms stretch around more, mm -hmm. for, for me anyway, than they have in the past. And uh, I think, I'm pretty sure that's clearly something that I needed to be reminded of and um, and so that's happened and then um, to um, pray for more common sense so I don't so I make good health decisions you know that kind of thing and then to pray for our leaders um, for and even those who um, I have been frustrated with for I think you know, misleading us that this isn't really a big thing. And so, I mean, and the Lord said, you know, first forgive. <laughs> and so there's that. And these are places that I just didn't know we'd, we'd be going. You and I shared on, via email about the, um, the racial trauma that it needs to be a, um, uh, put in our in our on our prayer list mm -hmm. and um and so but god is bigger we will never i said to one, to one of my little grandchildren because they're all the three youngest are school age children and you know they miss their school friends mm -hmm. and um and i said to them you'll never forget this year in this in your lifetime you'll never forget this and um and you'll learn that um you know the lord brought you through and so and that's that's you, you can't put a price on that kind of lesson it's not one we wanted but we'll never forget this yeah and we'll see god's faithfulness when we my church has is having virtual church, you know, on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Then we're having, I mentioned to you, the Bible studies and the virtual things. And um, and so when we turn on that Zoom call, you know, we're so grateful, Jamie, to see one another's faces mm -hmm. in a way that we just wouldn't have been in, in, you know, without this. So that's a long answer to your question, but that's what's been happening. Oh, I love it. I, the, the phrase that keeps coming to my mind or the picture or whatever is that birth is painful. And yeah. what, what is God birthing in 
our nation, in our world, and, and what can we be doing in our prayer lives to join with him and bringing that kingdom yeah. here, you know, bringing, bringing pieces of his kingdom here. And so a lot of stuff is moving. There's, there's movement in the world, but God is moving. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited yeah. to see, but that phrase in your book was really what got me sort of thinking in those terms of what, you know, what if it is the best year ever too? So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, how can our listeners find you and your books online and find you on social media if they want to check in with yeah. you? Well, I write for our daily bread. Um, and so usually at some time during the month, there may be one or two of my um, devotionals on, on their sites. And um, I also write for the Day Spring blog for women called Encourage, spelled I N. Um, C-O-U-R-A-G-E. Occasionally I'll write for In Touch Ministries and sometimes for Christianity Today. And, um, and then my website, it's patriciaraybon.com. And um, there's a little link there for people who want to click on and follow that journey with a lot of other people and um, read the blog and all of those things. And um, and then whatever other ways the Lord connects us, like he did today. Yeah. So, yeah, those are the ways. All right. Well, we will um, we'll link to your website. And are you on Facebook or yep. Instagram? Facebook, Facebook and yep. Instagram? Right. Okay. I am. And I'm not. Um, well, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. Well, we will. <laughs> Some days more than others. Okay. <laughs> Some days it's good not to be on. <laughs> so, all right. Well, how can we be praying for you today? And I will close us out in prayer. And just thank you, Patricia. This has been wonderful having you on the show. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I put, put uh, three things on my list. Safety and health for my family. Mm -hmm. um, revising that mystery romance prayer novel. The praying detective, and uh, for healing for our nation and our world mm -hmm. in every way and every place that needs God's touch. All right. Well, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time to sit and just be with you and um, talk about prayer and just share and hear from Patricia. Um, Lord, I just lift up Patricia and Dan and her family. Lord, we just pray your hand of protection and that you would just give them safety, that you would bless their health, that you would bless their marriage. We pray for her daughters and grandchildren. Lord, we just ask that you would be close with them and just working in their lives in mighty ways, that they would look to you each day and, and just see that you're there with them, Lord. Um, we do continue to join with Patricia just in praying for um, just for Alana and her family and just for you to reveal yourselves to them and your son, Jesus. And we thank you just for the, the confidence that we have that um, in all of the relationships that we have with people that just we desire to see come to you, Lord, that you've got this. And we just trust you and we acknowledge you as sovereign and powerful and the giver of every good gift, the withholder of no good gift. God, you are so good and so, um, so in control. We just pray just even for the strength to let go of the things that we hold on to. Yes. God, I just continue to pray for this fiction project that Patricia's been working on. Um, Lord, we just continue to pray for the revision of that book that you would just give her enthusiasm and energy. I know getting to the end and doing the revisions can be tedious and just give her creativity and just eyes to see exactly how you want it to come out. And we just pray that this book would, um, that you would just open doors for this book to reach people and just to point to you in a new way. And I thank you for that 
courage that it took for Patricia to step outside of, of what was comfortable and what she knows in writing nonfiction and just opening this fun new door to glorify you with her writing. We continue to pray for those of us in the U.S. praying for our nation. God, just for the, the racial wounds that, that go so deep. Father, we just pray for healing. Yes, Lord. We know that it, it could get um, worse before it gets better, and we welcome that. We welcome the um, opening of wounds so that you can be Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Use us as your people, as the body of Christ, to be a city on a hill when it comes to bringing about that healing. God, help us to be your voice, to be the people who love, the people who listen, the people who come together, the people who build bridges, and just allow your power to, to come down and just heal our land in, in that area, in every area. For those not in the U.S., God, we welcome prayers for the world, that you would bring healing to this hurting world, God, we know that you can do it, and we know that we're like yeast. The, the kingdom of heaven, we are, as believers, we are like yeast scattered through this 60-pound mass of flour. God, just a tiny bit of yeast can, can rise, can cause the whole loaf to rise. Help us to be like that, God. Help us to have yeah. faith that even though it feels like we're so small, we're such a small minority of, um, of people, that it would start with us, God, that you would bring healing to us as Christians, that you would open our eyes to ways that we're not walking in the way that you want us to walk so that we can be the beginning of healing for our, our land, for our world. In the powerful name of Jesus, God, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear our prayers. Amen. <laughs>